Warhammer 40,000 Bolt Gun is a first-person shooter developed by Auroc Digital and published by Focus Entertainment. Or, if my emails with them were correct, Focus ENTERTAINMENT! If you ask 40k fans, which I did not, boy howdy, did I not ask 40k fans, I didn't ask anyone about this game, but for about the last three months, a quarter of a year, I have received daily pings, DMs, emails, tweets, letters, smoke signals, bloodstained ransom notes, ravens, telegrams, singing telegrams, invasive telepathic communications, bricks thrown through my window with notes attached, phone calls saying that my grandmother's in the hospital and I get there and it's just friggin' bull Bolt gun! Y'all need to chill, okay? That's what I'm saying. Have some herbal tea, put on some nature sounds, shoot some heroin. I'm not a 40k nerd. I don't know anything about it, really, and I didn't read the lore before making this video because I really don't care about the lore. If you've watched the show and you've gotten the impression that I care about lore, I can't help you. From what I understand, from a distance, there's a lot of factions that are all fighting, and every one of them has really strong Are We The Baddies energy. I was gonna do a video on Bolt Gun anyway because the trailer looked cool. I'm not making a lifelong commitment to figurines and grass aversion for one game. No, Civvy, you said you were gonna be nice to the 40k nerds, so that's not nice. Okay, like I said, I was gonna play the game anyway because the trailer looked cool. Yeah, running, shooting, chunky pixels. I'm here for it. My kind of game. And that was just the reveal trailer. The official gameplay trailer goes right for the jugular. When the ruinous powers of chaos unleash their foulest abominations, who will prevail against the darkness? The Ultra! Yeah, the Ultramarines, he said, as if that held any significance to him. Hulk Gun is a gory, rapid-fire, boomer-shooter blast from the past! Whoa, cool! But I have some notes. If there's anything I want to impart to my audience, don't ever listen to marketing or PR people. They are not to be trusted, and only by the most pedantic technicalities do I consider them human beings. They are the priests of the grift, who trick you for the love of trickery and money, and my inherent distrust of them may have contributed to me only getting the game a few days early instead of much earlier, but hey, I don't really care if I have the first video to go up about a thing. My point is that Bolt Gun is not a boomer shooter, and they're only calling it that because it has chunky pixels. It's not a bad game, and I actually really enjoyed most of my time with it, but when PC Gamer rolls up and is like, As both a 40k fan with a deep love of the older source material and boomer shooter veteran, I was thrilled to find that Bolt Gun excels as a tribute to the insanity of the 41st millennium, and stands on equal footing with recent classics like Dusk, Ultra Kill, and Medieval. I wouldn't even call Ultra Kill a boom shoot, it's more of a character action game that I am absolutely terrible at. Dusk and Medieval, with their level design and the way enemy encounters are generally more fluid and happen organically as you progress through a level, that's boom shoot. Bolt Gun, and I want everyone to know this before going in, is a lot more like Doom 2016 than it is like a boom -a goo A sloot poof? A goop noob? Not to say it isn't a good game, but for Christ's sake, without the open level design that rewards exploration, a thing that Bolt Gun really only occasionally does, you might think it's gonna be like that at the beginning, as you're going along these snowy peaks, chain-sorting the lowest of the low-level enemies. Enemies that'll turn into pretty satisfying piles of gore with only one or two shots from the titular Bolt Gun. You know, once you actually get it. That's boom shoot stuff. And introducing you to the mechanics of the chain sword right away, getting the player acclimated to it is just good, sensible design. I mean, look, right, I have the perfect way to describe this. In the first level, you get this shout-out to E1M1 from Doom. That's a very clear imitation of that iconic starting room with the addition of this game's, and this universe's, rusty gray and brown sci-fi trappings. Really well-detailed rooms with a few less polygons and pixels than you'd normally see. I mean, just look at this sewer. <laughs> And my little flaming skull pal, who I love, even if he sometimes surprises me and I shoot at him, because having something suddenly pop up in a game like this, you know? Anyway, it chimes in sometimes with lore and fun stuff, and it says, These areas are maintained by Civ E level members of the local administratum workforce. So suck it, 40k nerds, because I didn't learn 40k lore, and now I am 40k lore. It's really hard to explain to my friends and family that I am most associated with sewers. But look what happens when you're in that Doom 1 homage. Purge the heretics, drink their blood, sodomize their sisters, steal their wine bottles. And 
maybe they're trying to do a thing like it says in the trailer. Warning! Old gun is an unyielding blend of old and new intensified by the most radiant 256 color palette that will literally melt your brain! Alright, calm down, trailer guy, I get it. And I guess having a locked room invasion inside of a tribute to the most famous FPS level ever is a blend of old and new. Hey look, they even included that secret wall that E1M1 has, except I waited until the battle was over so this power-up was wasted. The times you're locked into an arena to purge a wave of enemies like you just fisted a gore nest in Doom 2016 happens in most levels. Sometimes more than once, and I'd say that this is way more reflective of Bolt Gun's gameplay than something like the original Doom. Not Doom Eternal, though, because it isn't so fucking fussy that you have to swap weapons every quarter of a second so that you can maximize your damage output against different enemies. Although... Enemies and weapons have different strengths, like the shotgun in this game has a strength rating of 3, so it's less effective against enemies with a strength rating higher than that. The designers implemented this system in a way that made it immediately apparent and easy to read and understand, and at no point was I confused about how it worked. Sometimes you get upgrades to the weapons that'll give them unique buffs, which only last through the level. For balancing reasons, maybe. I don't know. I do know that picking up this power-up counts as finding a secret, because I think the majority of secrets in this game are power-ups that you pick up that are in full view of the player and are usually not hidden. That's not very boom-shoot of you, Bolt Gun. Sometimes you get an upgrade to the Bolt Gun that gives it a magazine full of Dragon's Fire rounds or little Railgun slugs, and that's cool. The weapons are also mostly good. Sound design on them is quite nice. Punchy, meaty... <laughs> The shotgun feels a little underpowered at first, until you get the melt-a-gun later and realize that they just made that your super shotgun and you're not gonna get too much ammo for it and you're gonna save it for the tank of your enemies. Why have it fire five of this ammo type at a time if this is the only gun that uses that ammo? Why not just two? Your chainsword is actually pretty fun even if I didn't use it a ton. I liked it aesthetically more than I liked it as part of the gameplay. You know, like finishing off a particularly annoying enemy by getting right in their face and you press a button to rev the thing while you're hitting it, and that's really satisfying. There's a power-up to boost your melee temporarily so you can cut right through stronger enemies, too. Some weapons seem completely superfluous, and by some weapons I mean this fucking laser gun, the Volkite Caliber. Which is great against low-tier enemies, but you know what else is great against low-tier enemies? The Bolt Gun! and the heavy bolter, though that forces you to slow down when firing it. Not very boomer shooter of you, Bolt Gun. The Volkite Caliber pisses me off because the goddamn thing needs to reload before I've killed even mid-tier enemies with it, and the game, after giving this to you, then gives you the game's BFG, the Grav Cannon, a weapon that actually kills stuff good. Even if it only has a strength rating of 5, same as the Heavy Bolter. The weapons with a strength rating of 7, which are the Melt-A-Gun and the Plasma Gun. The Melt-A-Gun, my favorite weapon in the game we've talked about. It's a gun, and it melts things, you know? The Plasma Gun, though. You think when you pick it up, it's gonna work like Doom's Plasma Gun. Rapid-fire energy balls. In reality, it takes the place of a rocket launcher in this game, with powerful projectiles that do splash damage, and will cut through most enemies' defenses easily, with a chance of overheating if you try to rapid-fire it and blowing up in your face. This is the only weapon in the arsenal that I know of that's so temperamental. The fact that it's at least effective is what's keeping me from wanting to banish it to the first episode of Dai Katana. You get a charge that can push enemies around, but I didn't use it much, and probably not to its full potential. I'll admit that. I'm not a Warhammer 40,000 bolt gun expert yet, even though I did play the game on hard and found it fairly easy, all things considered. I guess the taunt is a weapon, though I don't know what it does besides giving enemies time to shoot you while you rant about the Emperor. Smash them to pieces! 
shall be punished. I know only war for Terra and the Emperor. I kept pressing the taunt button after that, but he just stopped. I think he ran out. That's embarrassing. Especially since he could credibly say that he has balls of steel. Your most fearsome weapon only appears when you leave the character idle. Scripture. What else we got for weapons? Oh, of course, grenades. Three types of grenades, all of which are way more effective than the weak feedback would lead you to believe. So you got frag grenades, which will hit, show you the area of effect like fancy modern games like to do, which is necessary in this game because unlike everything else, the grenades in this game don't sound like they make much of an impact. While running inside of a giant tin can that the player exists in during this game, it clangs and clinks and the screen even has this effect when you're running that shifts up and down. But if you throw a grenade, it results in an explosive force that wouldn't strip a dandelion, but will jib a chaos marine. You got crack grenades, which are these. I think they're contact grenades. The Warhammer Lexicanium describes them as anti-tank weapons. So there, that's all the research into the lore I'm doing in this video. Because being wrong in a YouTube video sparks engagement. And engagement brings in that revenue to the Department of Special Corrections. Who knew that just going onto the internet and spewing bullshit could be profitable? And finally, the rarely seen Vortex Grenade, a weapon so powerful that I might hand the BFG status over to it. You know why? Because it killed the second boss for me. combat, like I've said, is less like an old-school game since in general the enemies are faster and the game delivers them via teleportation inside of an arena most of the time, though I think that enough time might have passed to call Serious Sam and Painkiller Retro. God, I'm old. You might think at the start that you're in for a classic boom shoot with the aforementioned E1M1 shout-out, and the first enemies you meet being soft fodder to enhance your power fantasy feel, definitely these weak-ass cultist enemies who will show up throughout the whole game to support larger enemies. While I'm here to talk about Bolt Gun, I'm gonna have to mention some of the things the game does bad. Like, really bad. These low-tier cultist enemies have a habit of blending into the background, which is not helped by putting a big red filter over the screen, or the nearly omnipresent patented Unreal Engine fog effects. Red fog, purple fog, it's a lot of fog. I can understand if you're using it to obscure things that are far away. I know that game, but it ain't for performance, right? Right? Once you start seeing more enemies, you know that the devs and the artists were like, hey, we want them to be able to see these enemies. And not just like the pink horrors, which I'm sure are probably also pink in Warhammer lore, just going off the name. Same with the blue horrors. But these enemies are very, very distinct and stand out. And the Chaos Marines have highlights on their armor that make them easier to spot. And the Nurglings... This game loves its Nurglings. And they're about as tough as the Wimpy Cultists, as are the Blue Horrors. But they're also fast enemies that the game sends in waves. Blue Horrors are especially a problem because they're practically silent and will flank you, come up behind you and take some health off. And the damage feedback, sometimes in this game, is kind of shit. Like, sometimes it's fine and you get little indicators on the screen when your armor, or contempt to use the weird 40k lingo, takes a hit. But then sometimes, no. You see, the blue horrors, when they don't just spawn on their own, spawn as a pair when you kill the pink horrors, unless you jib them. Which is a rule for a couple of enemies in this game, including... The... F fucking Aspiring Champion. Yeah, I know you can jib them to prevent them from instantly rising from the grave buffed as chosen champions, because despite all my heretic purging, God still hates me. They don't always come back, only if they hit you once and deal damage. How much damage? I don't know, because damage feedback with them is trash and their melee attacks are trash. And for those of you out there clutching the Emperor's Pearls at such a suggestion and saying it's a skill issue, 
Well, I'm gonna smugly go to the video evidence here and show you that this dirty bastard, this absolute fucker, his attacks land before he swings his axe, a full third of a second before that animation is done. That's an animator skill issue, you nerds. I feel like this game really puts me in the shoes of someone doing a religious crusade against these enemies because I hate some of them with a passion reserved for demonic forces. Plague Toads are confused about what constitutes a melee attack and can lick me from a distance from which I'd survive a low-yield nuclear blast and require mini-boss levels of punishment to purge. There are really tough enemies, specifically the Lord of Change, who is the first boss you meet and who shows up again and again throughout the game. Super tanky and super deadly if you're in his line of sight, because he picked up a trick from Chernabog and just has an attack that sets you on fire. It's okay, I wasn't using those 162 health points! Yeah, like I said, damage feedback is weird, especially when there's a big red fucking filter over everything. I'm not even saying that this game is particularly hard. If you're willing to look, it's pretty generous with health and armor, and I was playing on the hard skill because I thought going in on Exterminatus might be a bad idea. Usually games that heavily advertise themselves as old school like to play up how unreasonably difficult they are. Like, I only died a couple of times during the final boss fight, which is more of a constant stream of enemies plus a boss rush, plus a final boss. The final boss is also the boss of each episode of the game, so I don't suppose I killed him in the second episode, though I didn't really see what happened. His name is Tumulus Samuel? and he is very resistant to death. I have to knock his health bar down, what, like five times during this game? His plan is to do chaos. Look, the story of this game is unimportant, even in this genre. You wanna know? Okay, so... You are under the dominion of the Ordo Manius to assist my investigations into a world that has already felt that damn infamous. Briar has been under the close watch of the Inquisition since the Grim Skull War. Half of these words, at best, mean nothing to me, and at worst, make me laugh. The Grim Skull War. I will say that for a game that has a nearly non-existent story, I dig the animation in these cutscenes. While most of the planet remains unaffected, it is my belief that rogue elements within the Adeptus Mechanicus may have been experimenting with a surviving fragment of Inquisitor Drogon's power source. Your mission is to assist me in locating a fragment of the power source. Okay, Power Crystal, gotta get it. That's the game. This servo skull will guide you. Oh, so that's what that's called. Okay, so your drop pod crashes onto the planet and the game starts. There's a reason I've relegated the story to Chapter 4, nearly at the end of this video. It comes up once at the end of every episode. Once you beat the Sorcerer the first time, which I felt necessary to do with the Chainsword... You are weak as a baby pot. Go live in fear. After this, you chase the heretics to this canyon. Variety in the setting is somewhat of a problem in this game, as the episodes usually start off outside with snow or big desert canyons, but then you moved into Big Metal Tomb with Skulls on the Walls, or Big Metal Tomb with Skulls on the Walls in Lava, or Big Metal Tomb with Skulls on the Walls in Purple Shit, and most of these levels aren't bad. There's a lot of corridors that connect to arenas that connect to corridors that connect to arenas, and that's the progression of the game. Only sometimes does it seem to really open up in a significant way. So I think I'm I'm going to take the time now to highlight the good and the bad of these levels. Good. The level in the first episode that you teleport around in and it's pretty fun and even has a weird Escher-like navigation puzzle? Just follow the big red things, because we are playing Hexen. This is still a game about purging heretics. You know, it hasn't gotten beyond heretics. Bad. This slow-moving platform level in the second episode. I keep looping around to this goddamn thing and sitting and waiting for it, and falling off of things in this game means that, unless there's a death trap below it, the game teleports you back onto solid ground, which is cool, but this level became really, really tedious with all the waiting. The first time, there's things to shoot, but only then. The rest of the time, it's waiting. And waiting and waiting. Good. The servo skull says funny things sometimes. To proceed, descend. Warning, descent not advised. Yeah, tell me about it. People keep telling me to do a pro descent video like anyone is good at descent. Once you get to the drillers, you might as well be playing blood on extra crispy. Really, Marinax is my Infernix, I'll tell you what. Caution. Conspicuous quantities of ammunition detected. Ah, I see you've played one of these before. Path forward appears obvious. Likelihood of being too obvious, 50%. I love this thing. I want one of my own, except, like, maybe not with a human skull attached to it. That seems a little bit morbid. 
I hate you all. Probability of usefulness, 12%. Progress forward. Yeah, no shit, what else would I- Oh. Bad. This fucking room. Whoever made this room, fuck you. And that's it, really, after you kill old Tommy Sam. Excellent work. With the sorcerer defeated and the Mechanicus device destroyed, we bought Grya time. Bought time? I killed, like, thousands upon thousands of things. And that's it. After a surprisingly long 10 to 12 hour campaign, you're in for a life of war and bloodshed and getting licked by toads instead of the much preferable other way around. I've seen that critics have rated it as... Yeah, I mean, it's good, it's fun, it's not the best, but I enjoyed it fine enough. And the audience score over here, where the 40k nerds are, well, they just fucking love it, and I suppose that's good. Me? I'm out. My bolt gun obligations are done. I feel an immense sense of freedom and purpose. What about Herat City? Oh, god damn it! <laughs> <laughs>